So in this video, we're going to talk about Moira Buffini's play Dying For It, which, uh, as she puts at the beginning of it here, is a free adaptation of The Suicide by Nikolai Erdman. Now, I don't know Erdman's play, um, but it's I, I know that it is a 1920s, 30s, I forget. Soviet satire, um, and we really, we get that here. Like, this is clearly an adaptation that, for as much as it may be a free adaptation, it maintains the same, um, the same setting, it maintains some of the same concerns about, um, society, etc., etc. This play, Buffini's play, premiered in 2007. That's important. I'm going to, I'll, I hope I will remember to come back to that. Uh, remind me if I don't. But anyway, um, so the play is set in a slum in Moscow in the 1920s. Um, we get a very definite sense of the poverty of this family. Um, so this is, let me find the character list, Semyon Semyonovich Podsekalnikov. I'm not going to say his last name again because I said it terribly. Uh, Podsekalnikov, I think. Don't hold me to that. Uh, and his wife, Maria Lukanyova, or Masha, and her mother, Serafima uh, Ilyichna, maybe, I don't know, I'm terrible at this, terrible at pronouncing Russian names, apparently. Uh, so anyway, uh, Semyon is uh, unemployed, uh, Masha is employed, so she's supporting the family, but Semyon is depressed, he's, he's he feels emasculated because he's unable to find work, he's unable to provide for his family, etc., etc. And so he is in a deep depression. Now we get a sense from the setting of their poverty, because uh, we get stage directions here. Masha takes the candle from Serafima. She moves through the dismal space. We see it's not a proper room at all. Part of a hallway in a once fine but now semi-derelict house has been curtained off giving Masha and Semyon their bedroom. Serafima has the only private room on their floor. It looks like a revolution happened in the building a decade before. It suffered serious damage that has never been repaired. What was once a bourgeois home now, now houses the very poorest. Masha is making her way upstairs. We can just see the damaged staircase going up to the next landing, on which there are doors to the bathroom and Alexander's room. Alexander is their sort of upstairs neighbor. He's a very, very strong guy, uh, in, and he's he's a friend for uh, to uh, Masha and Semyon. The rickety stairs continue up to the attic where Yegor lives. Uh, Yegor is a kind of kind of squirrely part, uh, strong Communist Party supporter. Uh, the rickety stairs continue up. Uh, to an attic where Igor lives, and dis disappear down to the kitchen, the basement bed, sit bed sits, and the front door. Masha is on the upper landing. It's a okay. So uh, Masha has gone up to Alexander's room uh, because she thinks that Semyon is going to kill himself, um, and she's trying to. She thinks that Semyon has locked himself in the bathroom to try and kill himself. She wants Alexander to break down the door and get Semyon out so they can prevent him from killing himself. I think it was one of the greatest moments shortly after this. Uh, there's a, a lot of absolutely hilarious lines and phrases here. Uh, Serafima, who's, who's pretty devoutly religious, despite this now being officially atheist uh, Soviet Russia, uh, it says, Serafima lights another candle under an icon of the Virgin. And she says, Blessed Holy Virgin, I pray for the safety of my son-in-law. 
Preserve him from this lunacy and bring him on his knees safe before me, where I might blacken both his eyes and break his legs to restore him to your everlasting mercy. Amen. So we get a lot of that kind of thing in the play. Um, as it turns out, uh, Semyon was not in the bathroom and not attempting to kill himself. Uh, he had just sort of gone under his bed and stuffed newspaper in his ears so he couldn't hear Masha and Serafima and Alexander calling for him. When uh, Alexander finally finds Semyon, Masha and Serafima have gone out looking for him. Um, Alexander attempts to convince him that life is beautiful. Um, he sa so he says, life is beautiful, Semyon. Semyon says, right. Alexander says, life is a miracle, full of wonder. Semyon says, what has that got to do with me? Alexander says, everything. You're alive, aren't you? You're here at the dawn of a brave new age. Age of industry and the working man. Age of medicine and electrics. Simeon says, yeah, but what kind of age is it when they cut, off, cut us off because of an un unpaid bill? Alexander says, good question. The Dark Age. Simeon says, it's like living in caves, isn't it? Alexander says, I spent three weeks standing in line every day to get, uh, to get them to adjust that bill. Simeon says, yes. Alexander says, some bureaucrat in a heated office saying this regulation, that regulation, and if it's not electric, it's the wording on the license or my stall or a travel permit. One form or another, and finally, as the line stretches on before you through eternity, you find you're tired of living. So, we have these great bits where Alexander will attempt to talk Semyon into wanting to remain alive because of the beauty of life, and Alexander kind of ends up convincing himself that life is not worth living. So we've got these great reversals, and it's a, it's a tremendous amount of fun. Um, there are some moments of hope, uh, etc., etc., and they all get dashed. Like, uh, Semyon finds a manual to learn to play the tuba, and he, he figures, ah, I can give concerts at five rubles a concert plus tips. If I give 20 concerts a month, I'll make a fortune, etc., etc. But it turns out he does manage to get a hold of a tuba from, um, Give me just a second. Uh, Margarita. Margarita, who owns a nightclub and is Alexander's sometimes lover. Um, she happens to have tubas. Two tubas, because uh, her cafe gets, her cafe bar, uh, gets official state support, and so they are state-banned tubas. And she says, "Yeah, I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Semyon have one of them in exchange for Serafima cleaning the floors." But it turns out that in order to learn to play the tuba uh, by this, in this pamphlet that Semyon has found, you need to buy a piano to learn to play scales. So you get those, again, a lot of these kinds of reversals and things like this. So Simeon falls back into despair. Uh, he announces that he plans to kill himself. He goes out and he gets an illegal unlicensed gun to do it with. And then uh, Alexander brings in a guy named Aristarcha. Aristarcha is the first of a series of visitors who comes to Semyon wanting him, not not wanting to stop Semyon from killing himself, but wanting Semyon actually to kill himself in the name of some particular cause. So Aristarcha is the first of several, uh, the first of at least four distinct people who, who actually show up in the play in addition to two or three other people that we know send notes uh, to Semyon. Basically, the idea is that they try and convince Semyon to kill himself, and in his suicide note say, I have done this. Aristarcha wants um, him to, to say, I have done, I've killed myself because Russia stifles the intellectuals, and I, I believe in, in intellectual freedom. Uh, Cleopatra comes, 
she is very sensual, etc., etc. She's very like, oh, I believe in love and romance and everybody just wants me for my body, but my beautiful soul, my beautiful soul, etc. I don't know why I'm mocking her. She's fine. She's, she's, she's cool. Um, but basically she, she tries to convince Semyon to put in his suicide note that he is killing himself for love, for the beauty of their love, etc., etc. Um, Yelpity comes, and he's a priest. Um, he's kind of a shitty priest, though, because uh, he does he does sort of give up fairly quickly in terms of trying to actually save Semyon. Um, but then he turns, and he also starts asking Semyon to put a particular reason uh, in his suicide note, namely that Russia has strayed from God. Um, so we've got those ones. Um, at some point, Igor, who's not a sort of formal visitor, but is just, he sort of comes and goes, etc., etc. Um, uh, Igor basically says, uh, you've got to do it for the party party needs you. People are losing their fervor now. Uh, now we're not in active revolution anymore. There's something in the air, a sense of, I don't know, disillusionment. So we've got this thing. Uh, and then a writer comes along, Victor, later he comes along and he, he, he wants Semyon to put in his note that he, that Semyon is killing himself for art, for poetry, etc., etc. Alexander reveals to Semyon that he's been collecting fees from all of these people who want to come see Semyon and try and convince him to kill himself for their causes. Because Alexander has probably quite correctly diagnosed the actual problem that Semyon has, which is his poverty. And so Alexander has collected up a, quite a fistful of banknotes from these various visitors um, and he gives them to, um, he gives them to Semyon in an attempt basically to actually stop him from killing himself. Alexander is the one person who consistently throughout the play attempts to dissuade Semyon. Masha generally does, but she also gets really pissed at Semyon a number of times and she does tell him to go ahead and kill himself. We're not, it's not super clear she actually means it so much as she's enraged at that particular moment, etc., etc. Um, finally, they have a big party for Semyon uh, to celebrate him planning to shoot himself. Um, and, and he gives his statement. And it's actually, in a way, the perfect statement for what they want, what all of these people who have come uh, to try and persuade him want. So he says, you're so good to me, all of you, coming here. I'm a man alone, and you've shown me that you care about me, all of you. Look at you. You care about my words, my thoughts. And to my surprise, dear comrades, I find that I'm not afraid. My fear has gone. Yes, I'm going to die, and for the first time in my life, I'm completely unafraid. I feel a power growing in me, like a blaze in my head. There are 200 million of us in this so in this union of Soviets, a huge mass of masses, and I'm the only one not cowering in fear. I'm going to die. Hold me down before I start to fly. To think I have, uh, to think I finally have power. I can do anything, anything. Hold me back. I'm a colossus. I'm Caesar. You will see me everywhere, and I'm doing this for us, for all of us. This is me, Semyon, truly me. Shit your pants, you cowering in the Kremlin. I'm the arrow of disillusionment. The meaning of me will terrify you. I matter. I matter. I'm the genius I always could have been. My life will not insult me. I will not have lived a mockery. Today, tonight, this minute, this second of slippery time, my turn has come. I am, I am, and then stage direction say, the clock begins to strike 12, a deathly hush. Victor finishes scribbling. Semyon takes Victor's page. He signs his name. Semyon Semyonovich Podeskanal. 
Boris Kalnikov. Suck at that. So he, that's his sort of grand final speech, supposedly. Now, uh, he runs out of the room. They think he's gone to kill himself, etc., etc. Finally, they do hear a gunshot. Alexander has gone out to try and prevent him, etc., etc. Um, but everybody believes that he's dead. Uh, they find his body the next morning out on the wasteland under a tree, um, and they bring it back. And um, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't mark this bit, but there's one, there's one bit I really liked, um, where. They say that he's going to have a funeral modeled on Lenin's funeral. Um, though they obviously don't have that budget. I can't find it. But uh, that's another another great witticism of the play. Um, but the, the various people, um, uh, Aristokov, Cleopatra, Victor, Yelpidi, the various people who have tried to get Semyon to kill himself for their causes all contribute money to this lavish funeral. They buy a great coffin. They get uh, Serafima a nice hat, etc., etc. And Aristarcha talks. Of, Aristarcha mentions this: the reason that this is such a worthwhile investment for them is as gentlemen and people. There is no reason why Semyon Semyonovich could not be a poet and lover, political thinker, unemployed worker, religious devotee, and immortal to those who loved him. Our model dead man could be all of these things. So it, it's ultimately a play about making up a narrative. Making up a narrative regardless of what the reality is. And this is revealed in, in stark contrast toward the end of the play, because we learn, ah ha ha, that Semyon Semyonovich is not dead. He did attempt to shoot himself, uh, but he ended up actually getting very, very drunk, and then he attempted to shoot himself again, and he injured himself slightly in the head, then he fell asleep. And they brought him back, thinking that he was dead. He is not dead. And he wakes up. And basically he's like, mm, I don't really want to be dead. I would rather be alive. Um, and so, the upshot ends up being that uh, Margarita attempts to save him. Because uh, the, other, the other characters who actually want Semyon to kill himself for their causes, basically decide that they're going to kill him if he won't kill himself. And uh, Margarita threatens the, to dump a bucket of, of shit from the toilet on their heads if they, they don't uh, let him go. And then basically she says, Semyon, get out of that coffin. Kalabushkin, that's Alexander, put the lid on it. Semyon and Alexander obey her commands. Victor says, yeah, skip that bit. It's not important. And Margarita says, right, there's your body. There's your hollow truth. Take it and go. Aristarch, uh, Aristarcha uh, objects, but it's empty. Alexander says, who's to know? Margarita says, tell them he shot his head off and you can't show the corpse. Now pick it up, all of you. So this is what ends up happening, is, is Semyon Semyonovich lives. He he escapes, but they still, because they have a coffin, they still have that empty narrative of he died for the intellectuals, he died for love, he died for art, he died for God, whatever it is. They still have that narrative. And so we get we get that sort of political twist here. Now there is another twist at the end. Uh, because this is a Russian play, uh, things can't end happily, because in Russian literature, things don't end happily as a rule. So, 
Um, we have a really, really striking twist at the end. Uh, Seraphima has basically gotten a ton of money because the people who wanted to use Simeon's body for their own causes collected a fund to support Masha and Seraphima. And so now, uh, and Seraphima got a hold of all that money. Um, Masha says, M Masha does say, Mother, we have to give that back. And Seraphima says, How can we? It's Semyon's. He earned it by dying. Alexander has gone up to the attic uh, to, to get Yegor and bring him down to, the, to have a party with them. It says, Alexander comes out of the attic. He's ashen. Margarita asks, What is it? A hush falls. Alexander, what happened? Alexander says, Igor Timeyevich, Igor has hanged himself. Seraphima says, holy God, why? There's silence. And then Alexander says, he left us a note. Simeon says, what does it say? Alexander says, Simeon is right. Why live? So the most devoted party member, the guy who was enthusiastic about the Soviet system, ends up hanging himself. And again, we get we get that kind of reversal that we had earlier where Alexander was trying to, to talk to um, Semyon about the beauty of life, etc., etc. Um, and then that reversal of, of Alexander sort of coming to the realization, actually, things kind of suck. We have that same sort of transformation here, ending in... Um, ending in Igor's suicide. So, you know, it's a bit of a downer at the end there. But again, that's Russian literature, folks. Uh, now, I wanted to come back to this very, 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 very quickly. Um, this this point uh, that, that the play premiered in 2007. Now, that's really significant. Not necessarily 2007 as such, but... Um, since the Thatcher era in the 80s, Britain has seen substantial cuts to National Health Service, to public arts funding, to uh, education funding, all kinds of resources across the board. The social safety net has been progressively eviscerated over decades. This has meant substantial, not as, not as much as the American social safety net has been eviscerated, but pretty significantly nonetheless. This has meant increases in poverty, uh, increases in deprivation, increases in um, crime, increase, all of these negative social consequences that come with wealth inequality and with high levels of poverty. In a way, this is a very fitting play to revive and, and to adapt in the early years of the 21st century. 